so the pho in America for decades was like really a little too sweet for a mm. lot of people. My parents' generation, they're from the north where, where they're kind of honestly kind of salty people. <laughs> <laughs> And the Southerners are sweeter. (laughs) They were born in the North. They moved South because of the separation of the country and wartime. So we come here, but they're still holding on to their salty Northern roots. (laughs) Welcome to Mind, Body, Spirit, Food. I'm your host, Nikki Sizemore. And in this podcast, we explore the cultural influences around food and how food connects us and sometimes disconnects us to our minds, our bodies, our spirits, the earth, and our communities. We also talk about recipes, cooking tips, and more. This is a space that is dedicated to bringing more presence, ease, and joy into the process of feeding ourselves. Let's dive in. Hello and welcome back to the show. I'm so glad you're here. Today's episode is such a great one. I speak with Andrea Nguyen, who is the author of seven acclaimed cookbooks, including her latest, Evergreen Vietnamese, which was named one of the best cookbooks of 2023 by the New York Times, Food & Wine, the San Francisco Chronicle, and others. In today's conversation, Andrea shares her journey from moving from Vietnam to the United States at the age of six and how food played a really important part in her identity, even as the foods that they cooked changed to kind of fit in with their new American lifestyle. We talk about the evolution of food and how cuisines evolve and how the point should never be perfectionism. Andrea also shares her journey writing her latest book, Evergreen Vietnamese, which started with a health scare and ended by bringing her closer to her cultural roots. We talk about what it means to live a healthy lifestyle and how this is really unique for each person. And it doesn't have to involve restriction or regimen, but can be playful, a way of getting to know our own selves. Andrea says that eating a way that feels good for our bodies is a practice, much like, you know, playing a sport or doing yoga. It takes practice, but the more we do it, the easier it becomes. And I found the more we do it, the more joyful it becomes as well. Finally, Andrea and I also discuss the problems with labels when it comes to defining diets or ways of eating. Labels not only constrict us, but they pit one thing versus another thing. You know, this is good and this is bad, when really it's just what works for each individual. We even talk about the term Mediterranean diet and the problems with that label. There's so many nuggets of wisdom in this conversation. And Andrea also shares some really delicious ways of using different ingredients. Her joy is infectious. It was such a pleasure to speak with her. And I think you guys are going to feel that as well. As always, an easy way you can support this ad-free work is by rating the podcast on your podcast app, leave a comment, share it with your friends and family. You can also become a subscriber to the Mind, Body, Spirit Food newsletter, where I share weekly recipes and dive into some of these topics in a deeper way. And if you become a paid subscriber for just a couple of dollars a month, you make all of this possible. This work could not happen without the support of paid subscribers, and I'm so grateful for all of you. All right, my friends, let's dive in. Andrea, hi. It is such a joy to have you on the show. Oh, Nikki, what a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. I am so thrilled. I have long loved your work, and you have taught me so much about Vietnamese cooking and Vietnamese flavors, which is one of my favorite cuisines. And this isn't a cuisine I had any experience with until I moved to New York City in my young 20s. And now that I live in the Hudson Valley and I can't get Vietnamese food anywhere near us, I can cook it at home. And so I'm so grateful for you. Oh, well, Nikki, you know, that's sort of my story in a way, because I was born in Vietnam and my family Mm. lived in Saigon, you know, a big city. And then we fled Vietnam in 1975 and moved to a very small beach town in Southern California, where, of course, there was no Vietnamese food around, Mm. except for whatever that we made. And so that was really like, you know, my entry point into figuring out, well, you know, the flavors of my heritage, and then eventually having the great fortune of being able to share it with other people. 
Well, you just jumped into my first question, which is the first question I ask all my guests is what is your cultural background and how has that influenced your relationship to food? So you've already started that question, but can you get into that a little bit more as well as share what the journey was for you growing up in Southern California to becoming a food writer? Sure. Well, first of all, I came to this country not speaking English. I, mm. I didn't know you know, much of anything. My parents both spoke English. My dad was fluent. But, you know, we came here to start a new life. And, you know, America afforded so much to Vietnamese refugees like my families. We came here in 1975. And we were really like the lucky bunch that we came on a plane. We were among the first wave of refugees to land in America. And people were like really generous to us. And part of it was really, you know, the result of the Vietnam War and the American involvement. And some people call that the American War, but it was a war and a mm. civil war. And my family lived in South Vietnam, which the American military was trying to uphold, but it didn't work out. But the country was just a mess for a long time during its modern history. And, and a lot of people they knew that it was time to leave for somewhere else. And so when we came here, it was a matter of like, well, how do we figure out a way to be Vietnamese in America? And we didn't know what that was. My parents, mm -hmm. you know, they liked to cook, they loved food, but they didn't have, you know, like the ability to walk outside to a street vendor, Yeah, you know? You know, like in New York, you weren't you go outside and get like, yeah. you know, something off the street from one of those trucks that are, you know, belching whatever. And you're like, yeah, I'm just going <laughs> to get a slice of pizza or, you know, a shawarma or whatever. And you don't have that anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's part of your identity and your experience. So we cooked a lot at home and we were also really curious about other food. And anybody who's eaten like a Vietnamese bun mi sandwich. Mm -hmm. And you can make the gluten for free if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> we can talk about that at some point if you'd like. Oh, yeah. But, um, <laughs> but I mean, like, if you bite into a bun mi sandwich, what you're looking at is a confluence of so many different cultures. Mm. Right? Let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's what Vietnamese food, people are like, ah, I hate fusion. It's such a weird thing. But I'm like, ah, fusion is how, like, cuisines come together oftentimes. Yeah, because you look at that, I'm sure the baguette, the sandwich bread came from France, the pate. What are the different elements? Let's just go really quick because maybe there are listeners who've never eaten a banh mi sandwich and we're going to make them must go make one or eat one. Right. So a banh mi sandwich consists of a very light baguette style roll. And then inside you can have it lined with butter or mayonnaise. You can have pate, you can have different kinds of cold cuts. That it could be like a kind of ham or a mortadella that is very Vietnamese style. You can even have like a head cheese. You can have chashu pork. You could put essentially whatever you want as mm. the main feature. Even a fried egg is good. And then you got these pickles, daikon and carrot. You got chilies. And, you know, chilies are from the Americas. And they came mm. to Southeast Asia by way of the Portuguese. So it's like, mm -hmm. think about that. How did that get there? Cilantro, cucumber. And then you enclose all of that and it's sort of like a sandwich in a roll because there's like so yeah. much stuff, right? Yeah. So so that's like the vibrancy. It's like this wonderful party of different elements and colors that yet you're sinking your teeth into. And so you're taking a look at this confluence of the East with the West and then you bring that to America and in some places... You know, if you're in New Orleans, that's called a Vietnamese po' boy. Mm. If you're in Philly, that's a Vietnamese hoagie. Mm -hmm. You know, not necessarily a bun mi, but I'm looking at I'm like, that's a bun mi. But you know what? But it's like <laughs> change because as people go to different places, yeah. the cuisine it remains intact, but it also changes and evolves. Well, this is so interesting because it really is demonstrative in a way of your own identity coming to America, sometimes we want to have these things be so static. And the reality is that change is the only constant. So as a young American girl, 
still incorporating elements of your Vietnamese cultural upbringing. How did that merge together and change for you and your family? Well, you know, it happened a lot at the supermarket, Mm. right? Because like when we came here, we didn't have Vietnamese markets. We lived like an hour and a half away from a Chinatown. So we went to the American market and we're like looking around and seeing what was available. And for anybody who thinks like, oh man, I can't make, you know, Vietnamese food the way that I had it at my Vietnamese restaurant. Well, it's like, oh, come on. You know, you got lettuce, you got cilantro, you got mint, you know, nowadays you can get fish sauce, you get rice, soy sauce, you're good. And then there are certain Mm -hmm. things like sugar. I mean, I know that sounds so boring, right? But in Vietnam, like we have this really finicky sugar that we would use to make something called a caramel sauce, which is not for ice cream, but rather for braising. It's kind of like a bittersweet sauce that's just melted sugar that's nearly, nearly burnt. And we would cook that, simmer different kinds of proteins with it for these really homey, savory, slightly sweet dishes. And in Vietnam, the sugar was not well refined. But in America, my mom was like, oh my gosh, this is refined sugar. I can use this so nicely. And so there are like certain advantages with coming here. And then like when we, let's circle back to the banh mi, like you go to a supermarket bakery aisle and there you can make a banh mi from French style rolls. You can make it from a bolillo roll. If, you know, if you're gluten-free, you can make it from sliced white bread if you'd like, Mm. or a little gluten-free roll. I mean, things have changed so much since my family got here in 1975. And so Vietnamese cuisine is a very inclusive one. But I guess, Nikki, my job is to provide you with the parameters and guardrails so that you still have the essence of Vietnamese food to, you know, you're experiencing that and that you don't, you know, go way too off course. Whenever I talk about my own recipes, I describe them as just a framework. They're a framework. They're like this safe structure that a person at home can then go into and they can follow it to a T or they can use their own intuition within that structure and start to make it their own. And what I love about what you're saying about all of this is that perfectionism isn't the point. The perfectionism of making the most authentic banh mi sandwich at home isn't the point. And perhaps there is no such thing as a perfect (laughs) quote unquote banh mi sandwich. So just to explore and to Honor, you know, I think it's really important that we honor the roots of where these foods came from. And at the same time, to be realistic with what we have on hand and what we can use in our own kitchens. Exactly. I mean, so well said. Because, you know, I look around and banh mi and pho, for example, have evolved in America. So as a young person, I was just eating really like strict stuff that my mom had written down recipes for in this tiny little orange notebook that she Mm. brought to America with her. And it's now like a family heirloom. It's like one of the few family heirlooms that we have. And she gifted it to me in 2006 Mm. when my first cookbook published. And so like I keep it in a safe place in my house. Uh And if there's like a fire or something, it's one of the first things I'm going to grab. But I mean, like from that period onwards, like we really changed the way we made pho. For example, in Vietnam, you would cook pho by charring these really teeny tiny shallots that are the size of like boiling onions. Wow. And little nubs of ginger. <laughs> but when we came to America, oh my God, shallots are really expensive. And so people switched to using yellow onion, mm. which is actually in Vietnam more expensive. But then the flavor of the pho changed. And Mm. so that because yellow onion is much sweeter than, say, a shallot. And then the flavor of pho, because it was like transported here and developed by Southern Vietnamese people who have a slightly sweeter flavor profile. So the pho in America for decades was like really a little too sweet for a Mm. lot of people. My parents' generation, they're from the North where where they're kind of honestly kind of salty people. (laughs) And the Southerners are sweeter. (laughs) They were born in the North. They moved South because of the separation of the country and wartime. So we come here, but they're still holding on to their salty Northern roots. (laughs) 
<laughs> and so the food here, it tended to be a lot sweeter than what a lot of people liked. And then, of course, you know, we can talk about nutrition. Is that sugar is really super affordable here. And mm. we love sugar, right? Everybody yeah. loves sugar, all humans. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so overall, the Vietnamese food in America became sweeter. And I think health-wise, it has not been good mm. for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. In terms of, you know, they've developed like diabetes and they're just eating more than they would in the motherland. And so diets have changed as well. And, you know, these shifts of like greater wealth oftentimes are not necessarily like the best thing, unintended consequences, right? Yeah. But the food itself, you know, pho has like become sweeter, but then like a new generation of cooks that are not like staunch like my parents aren't necessarily, you know, like second, third generation, they're making like merging pho with banh mi. Mm. And some of them are like making pho dumplings. Mm -hmm. So, and then in Vietnam, because you talked about cuisine not being static, in Vietnam, when I research pho for my pho cookbook, people are like, oh, Andrea, you must go and drink the pho cocktail. And I was like, what? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, someone in Hanoi had made like this twenty-five dollars, <laughs> Nikki, twenty-five dollars. What? <laughs> in like twenty fifteen, I paid twenty-five dollars wow. for a cocktail wow. in Vietnam that was a fun mm. cocktail in a and very it, swank historic hotel. I'm like, was it worth it? It was because they did this whole show of like lighting the spices on fire and everything. So (laughs) my food stylist and I went on a research trip and we were like, whoa, it was a little sweet because they use like certain kinds of spirits that were on the sweet side. But it was a show, you know, a little bar floor show. (laughs) <laughs> That's okay. Now, I want to get back into the food, but I want to circle back because it sounds like your mom was a cook and she was really influential to you. When did you decide that your career was going to be in food? When I couldn't get a job. <laughs> I love that answer. I, I mean, you know, I don't <laughs> any romantic responses, Nikki. (laughs) But it was like this thing where, you know, if anybody knows food media, you know, you realize that it has long been grounded in New York. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. We came here and I really fell in love with reading cookbooks because we couldn't afford like for my parents to buy like, you know, they weren't giving me pocket money to go to the book fair, for example, because we were a family of seven. And both of my Mm. parents worked. And, you know, I, for the first few years of my life, I was one of those, you know, free lunch program kids. Mm -hmm. But I've started bringing my own sandwiches (laughs) to lunch because I was like, you know, I've like tasted that hamburger and that pizza and I've had enough. But that's a totally different story. (laughs) But, you know, I I went to the library and checked out cookbooks Mm. and I started reading them and my family let me practice on them. Hmm. So for me... I thought, wow, you know, cookbooks are really great tools for learning about different cultures. And then when I was a teenager, there were Vietnamese cookbooks that came out. But I was like looking at them like, there's olive oil in there. Why the heck is there olive oil? Mm. And I was like, we don't use olive oil when we cook Vietnamese food at home. And it was also not about the Vietnamese experience in America. It was all removed and talking about Vietnamese people in Vietnam going back. And there was a certain romanticism about it. And it wasn't really home cooking as I experienced it. Mm. And I was like, it just sounds so exotic. And it was written by older people. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I want to write a Vietnamese cookbook, you know, about Vietnamese people in America, about people like me. There must be a lot of people like me because yeah. I see them in little Saigon. And so <laughs> I wanted to write cookbooks, but I just didn't know how. And there were agents interested, but they're like, you're not on Food Network, can't get you a deal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or some agents just didn't respond. And so my husband and I eventually in 1998 moved to Northern California, to the Monterey Bay, a little town called Santa Cruz, which is also another beach town. And I couldn't for the life of me get work. Hmm. 
I have a business background. I have a master's degree in communication management. And I moved to this little town and there was like no work unless yeah. I like, you know, went over the hill to work in Silicon Valley, which was really like a schlep for me, like an hour away. And so I started building a website and thinking, well, maybe I would just have, you know, this little website. And that was like in 2002 or something like that. So, you know, the dinosaur age for all of this stuff, it was. blogging, right? <laughs> and I just couldn't get work. But I eventually got lucky because I got like this temporary gig at the local university in Santa Cruz and met someone who introduced me to someone. And eventually that someone <laughs> introduced me to the owner of 10 Speed Press. Mm. And 10 Speed Press is one of the foremost cookbook publishers in the United States. And I had so many cookbooks in my collection at that point because I was buying them from used bookstores and, you know, that was like really before Amazon really took off. So I was like buying a lot of stuff from used bookstores yeah. and regular bookshops, you know. And I was like, oh, 10 Speed Press, mm, I know them. And they also had a certain expertise and awareness about Asian food. Mm. And so that's how I got started. And so my first cookbook was published in 2006. And 10 Speed Press really supported me from the get go and put their best team on the project. So I was able to you know, that book did very well and yeah. awards finalists and all blah, blah, blah. So, you know, rejection yeah. listeners can sometimes, you know, allow you to like fight back <laughs> mm -hmm. and you never know where life's going to take you. You know, I've, I've said this publicly, I don't have an agent. And because when I started out, Asians didn't want me. So I was like, all right, well, I don't, you know, <laughs> mm. but I somehow I figured it out. Yeah, there's all sorts of different paths. And even though the seed was planted in your head earlier on, it didn't happen for a couple years later after you very fortuitously you know, met this person who was connected. But I just I love these stories because as we look back, we can see that there is no linear path to anything and that your path is the right path, whatever it looks like for you. It is. And I think nowadays, you know, there's almost like this oh my God, I've got on TikTok. And then all of a sudden I was just like a sensation. And then, you know, a, a, an editor contacted me and an agent he contacted me. And it sounds so like, not just it's overnight, you know, during, you know, these pandemic, you yeah. know, breakout things. And those stories do happen. But by the time that you hear about them, you almost want to like, be trying to figure out some different path for yourself. And that path is going to be whatever that life gives you. And I have no mm. answers, but I just think that, you know, kind of daydreaming a little bit is good, mm -hmm. but also just always keeping your eyes and ears open for opportunities to, you know, see if you can like achieve your goal somehow and practice writing yeah. and recipe developing. And I love, Nikki, what you do because you're also teaching. And that's really yeah. important. Well, thank you for saying that. And it's true. Sometimes we see the shiny paths so often and we think, well, why isn't that happening for me? And it's very easy to just get discouraged. But like you, I've had a million no's. And what I thought I wanted my life to be, I actually, if I, you know, 20 years ago saw what I was doing now, I would be overjoyed. But in no way would I have ever imagined the crazy winding turns that got me here. And it's by no means perfect, but it is like just continuously checking in and trusting with what my heart is aching for. And even if that means, like you said, doing things for free for a little while, you know, on the side while I'm hustling to make the income, but, you know, having the blog on the side and all of that stuff. So I just love that. It's a lot of hustle. Yeah. It is a lot of hustle, but you know, now more than ever, people can have these little megaphones mm -hmm. where, you know, you can say stuff, you know, and to develop a community and it, you don't have to be super loud. Mm. Amen to that. Right. Yeah. I mean, you just have to develop 
a community there, you know, there are a lot of people on this planet and you will find your tribe. (laughs) I tell myself that. (laughs) Yeah, same. (laughs) Yes. Well, I want to get back to your most recent book, which I have in front of me and which I love. It's Evergreen Vietnamese. And it features plants as the star. And for my listeners probably know this, I'm not a vegetarian, but I love cooking with plants. You know, I was an artist kid. And for me, cooking with plants is my way as an adult to play with art because they're so beautiful and colorful. And my husband grows them in the garden and I get to, you know, have my hands on them. But you say in the introduction to this book that incorporating more vegetables into your diet actually was brought on by necessity, but also that it connected you in a deeper way to your cultural roots. And I'd love for you to get into that a little bit. Yeah. So in 2019, after I finished touring for my book that was published that year called Vietnamese Food Any Day, it was a very successful book, but I had like traveled so much and eaten so many weird things. And I had turned (laughs) 50 that year. And for folks out there who are you know, approaching 50 or past 50, it's the kind of time of your life where a lot of people end up reassessing Mm. the first 50 years and how you ate. And Mm. I was not well. I mean, I had had to rejigger my diet and I realized that I was going through perimenopause and I had like a health scare. There was like this strange bulge in my lower abdomen and I didn't know what it was. My doctor was like, oh, you have a hernia. I think you need to go get an ultrasound. Mm -hmm. And it turned out not to be a hernia. And I was so scared because, you know, not a lot of women have hernias. And Mm -hmm. I was like, what can I do to really like rejigger my diet and Mm -hmm. my whole lifestyle approach to just be more calm? Mm Mm-hmm. And I had eaten way too much of too many things combined at the same time. Because, you know, then this profession, you go out to a restaurant and if the chef or restaurateur knows you, then you may get half to two thirds of the menu. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious. I want to try it all. Mm -hmm. And I want to honor all the people who put that food together. So I'm often trying to clean my plate a little bit too well. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, and drinking and travel. It's, it's str- it was really stressful. And I think that, you know, you don't have to be in food to have that kind of, of experience either. I mean, I just think that that work balance, you know, that trying to balance work with your life and your health is very, very difficult. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I love plants, but I was not eating them or cooking with them to the point where I truly prioritize them. So I was like, what can I do? And I looked around at different diets. And honestly, I'm not good with restrictive diets. I was like, no paleo for me, because that's really like, you know, I love rice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Keto, you know, I like fats, but not mm-hmm. that much. And I like sugar sometimes. I love my sweet and condensed milk. And Mediterranean diet, there's only so much olive oil I can eat. Mm. And so I was like, what can I do within my level of knowledge, my sphere of knowledge? And what can I, you know, make that I feel comfortable with, that I know something about? Mm -hmm. And I realized that was Vietnamese food. And so I started checking out Vietnamese food and realizing that traditional Vietnamese food was basically about plants and with very Mm -hmm. little meat. You know, and I was like, Lord, you you look at like a Vietnamese salad or even pho. Everyone says, oh, well, it's meaty. But really, when you eat pho in Vietnam, you realize, especially in the north where pho came from, there really isn't that much meat. Hmm. What makes up, you know, the broth, there's like vegetables, there's spices, there's thyme. The noodles are made out of rice. Hmm. When we talk about banh mi, you know, like the protein element is like, whoo, the star. But you could put tofu in there. You yeah. could make a mushroom pate. You can even make like vegetarian Vietnamese bologna, which I did. And even make a vegan mayonnaise if you want, or put avocado in that sandwich. But all those other elements, all the vegetables and the roll, it's all made out of plants. Mm -hmm. And when I started thinking about that, I was like, oh, I just, I need to like figure out ways to like emphasize plants more. It's already happening. It's natural, but I need to do it in a way that's much more aggressive. Like 
all right, you know, I don't need to plan my meals around the meat Mm. all the time or just make it really smaller elements, traditional Vietnamese food, like use meat as an accent because people couldn't afford it. Yeah. You know? And I checked in with my mom because I felt better when I started eating all this stuff. And I was like coming up with my versions of like vegan Vietnamese food, you know, and I told my mom, oh, you know, I feel so much better, you know, and I lost weight too. My mom's like, oh, you look better. I'm so glad you feel refreshed and reborn. She used these words in Vietnamese. And I said, you know, what? it's about low meat eating mom. And she looked at me, she said, huh, and this isn't damning with faint praise. This is like a mother. Okay, just saying her child, you're good, kid. She says to me, oh, we ate that way in Vietnam. I was like, what? (laughs) She said, that's how we ate in Vietnam. I changed our diet when we came to America. Mm. I did not know that. I mean, you know, that was like five years ago. So I was like 50 and we had lived in America were like, you know, close to 45 years at that point. (laughs) That was the first time my mom like ever shared that with me. And I said, what did you do? (laughs) And she said, well, like meat was so expensive in Vietnam. You could buy like seafood relatively inexpensively like fish. And she said, but chicken and beef were expensive and pork to a certain extent. So she said, like, if I wanted to make a stir fry, for our family of seven, it was actually a household of eight, including our cook. She said, I would, you know, like have about 300 grams of protein. And I was like, that's like 10 ounces for mm, a, fa- a household for- of eight. Wow. Raw protein. Not even a pound. Not even a pound. Raw protein. So anyone who's cooked out there, <laughs> it kind of shrinks. Uh huh. <laughs> so, yeah. And she got, <laughs> and I was like, but I was still chubby when I was in Saigon. How did that happen? And she goes, well, I always made sure you were well fed. Oh. <laughs> but the thing is that like, you know, it was this epiphany for me. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm returning to my food roots hmm. and I feel good, you know, and I can sustain this. And I feel like these are ideas that are doable by people of not just, you don't have to be Vietnamese to make my recipes. And because we live in a cross-cultural society. And so if I can make a taco, enjoy pizza, a hamburger, you can also make rice paper rolls and bun mi and pho Mm -hmm. as part of your repertoire. I mean, we can all do that kind of exchange, but I felt like there just had not been a plant forward plant-based Vietnamese cookbook that really like opened the door to people to eating healthier and also just playing with vegetables. Because I mean, like you and your husband have a garden and all of a sudden, you know, you go to the garden, you're like, oh my God, look at those plants. Yeah. Now we have to eat them. (laughs) You can't wait to eat them. The harvest, it's all about the harvest. (laughs) He gardens, I harvest. I'm terrible at growing things, so that's the job. <laughs> yeah, no, what I mean, like, but then you can like tell him, you know, yeah. honey, <laughs> you can grow this, you can grow that, yeah. or just go to the farmer's market. You know, yeah. I can spend days looking at a seed catalog. I can't grow yeah. much of what your seed catalog offers, but I'm fascinated yeah. by what can be grown yeah. and what our farmers can produce and also what's in like Asian markets, you know. But also what's doable from like a regular supermarket. I mean, it's like nowadays, yeah. shoot, you can get like turmeric, like yeah. fresh turmeric at the grocery store. Well, and what I love about your story, this health story, is that A, I believe that everyone's journey with health is very unique to them. The thing that stands out to me is that this journey wasn't about being punitive or about a diet culture kind of mentality. This was a shift that also brought you joy that opened the door to more flavor. When I had to cut gluten out of my diet after my first daughter was born and I thought I was it was awful. I was like, no, I'm a chef and this is not possible. And it ended up being so fun because for somebody who loves to cook, all of a sudden there are all of these new flavors that I got to explore and play around with. And that's how it feels for you, this journey of 
finding better balance in your body was maybe not always easy, but it doesn't sound like it was horrible either. No, I think that we talk about the whole term diet is just so like, yeah, it yeah, sounds gross. I mean, yeah. who wants to diet? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Nobody wants to diet, but we all want to live, you know, healthier lives. I mean, mm-hmm. that's kind of like, who wants to live an unhealthy life? I'm sorry. You know, it's no. kind of like, no one says that. Yeah. But I mean, we want to figure out ways that we can live healthy. And when you start exploring, let's just talk about mushrooms. Okay. I mean, mm-hmm. like, cause mm-hmm. like I use a lot of mushrooms and we always talk about mushrooms as being earthy. But the thing is like mushrooms have so much and they're not always earthy. They sometimes mm-hmm. don't have flavor, but they have texture. And when you cook with them, sometimes they squeak. Yeah. And so they're talking to you. And then, like when I was trying to make this five spice mushroom walnut pate, I was like buying these mu- so many mushrooms because <laughs> I was going round and round on that because I wanted to really make like a pate that could just stand up right next to like its livery friend, you know, like the livery original. And then like one day like the, I had so many mushrooms, they kind of like went a little bit weird and got a little too mature and they opened up like big parasols. And I thought, yeah. oh, good God, I can't use these mushrooms. But then I was like, you know, I can't go to the store yet, right now because it was late at night. I made the pate with the mushrooms. And then I realized at that point, Even though the mushrooms were kind of wizened and practically seemingly, you know, over the hill, they made better pate because Mm. they were more mature Mm -hmm. and they had dehydrated just a little bit and they had a much more concentrated flavor. And so all of a sudden you're like, oh, wow, you know, even like a common ingredient, like a cremony or, you know, baby bell mushroom, like you don't always want the perfect little mushroom. You want Mm. them maybe to be the ones that are like opened Mm. up like a, a big umbrella, sun umbrella. And like, Other mushrooms that we have access to, like oyster mushrooms that, you know, you now see at the market, or maybe you can grow them yourself. They have like this very rich, fatty texture. Mm -hmm. And they don't have a ton of flavor, but they have that texture. And you can like put them into salads, you know, an oyster mushroom. And I never realized this when I, not an oyster, a king oyster mushroom. They're like really like dense things. And in Vietnamese, because I... They're called chicken drumstick mushroom. Wow. (laughs) And I was like, what the heck? And then once I started playing with them, I was like, oh, they really do have the texture of Mm. like a chicken drumstick. Wow. And so like I started thinking about, all right, so how do I play with them so that it's it's a really interesting way to mimic the texture of chicken thighs, chicken legs. And so, you know, it's like all of a sudden, like just within the sphere of mushrooms, I was like, that's cool. My take, <laughs> my take, awesome. It's like, yeah, has a little crunch, like oh, uh, tendon. I mean, you know, and if you're a vegetarian, you're going to think, oh, Andrew, that's so gross. You're like making these equivalencies with like animals. But then I am not going to be a total vegetarian. Right. But I want to encourage people to enjoy vegetables and to celebrate vegetables and truly, you know, to make them the starring players in your kitchen because they're so fun. They're so fun. And that's something I just want to emphasize is like just hearing you talk and hearing how playful you are. And people might think, oh, but you guys are both cooks and this is what you do for a living. And yeah, that's true. This is maybe our creative outlet. But again, we get back to that perfectionism thing. And it's like, Ditch that. Play with your food. And sometimes it's not about the flavor. It is about the texture. And no other ingredients can offer such a wide diversity of textures as vegetables can, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Like even, you know, the daikon and carrot pickle. I mean, like, you know, the thing that why do you want to make that at home when you can just like, you know, because it's going to taste so much better. And Like, don't just make it with carrots because carrots are a little too boring for that. You know, I would see that at, like, Vietnamese banh mi shops. I'm like, you were lazy. You need the (laughs) daikon in there because you want that funk. You want that bite. And that's what makes it exciting. Then sometimes they squeeze the hell out of them so that there's no more brine left. And I'm like, I'm now just chewing on, like, this sad, soulless vegetable. (laughs) So, like, but when you make it at home, (laughs) dear listeners, like, you can not just daikon but like change it up use like a watermelon radish 
mm-hmm. you know, and then that's going to turn the thing pink. Mm-hmm. And then let's say you want to like color it up Middle Eastern style, add a little beet to there along with the carrot. Or if you don't want, you know, to use beets because beets have a minerally quality, use a different colored carrot. And people say, oh, Andrea, you're talking about sort of produce that you can only get in California because that's like a California lifestyle. Well, you can buy like multicolored carrots from like Trader Joe's. Yes, yes, yes. You know, and Trader Joe's is in 45 states, not in every single corner of the 45 states, but I'm just like putting it out there because there's like all of this variation yeah. in produce. And a lot of our supermarkets, they're expanding, but we as consumers need to be asking for it. We need to yeah. be looking for it. So that creates the demand. And if you don't play with your vegetables, then your vegetable selection is going to remain kind of boring. Yeah. You know, you know I want to circle back to something you said, because I think this is important to bring up. And you brought up the label of vegetarian and you said you're not one. And I have to say, I have nothing against any of these diets or these ways of eating. But what I do find a little bit of fault with are these labels. Because anytime we put a label on something, it means there's an opposite. There's an opposing thing. And you recently had a newsletter about the label of the Mediterranean diet and how problematic that label is. Because it has come, the New York Times had a whole spread on it recently And it's kind of come to define this quote unquote healthy way of eating. And yet within that spread, they had global ingredients, ingredients that are not found in the Mediterranean. And labels not only bind us, but they matter because then we start to assume that healthy way of eating is the Mediterranean Eurocentric way of eating. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I think this is just eye-opening for people to see how the words we use matter. Well, you know, the Mediterranean diet, like getting back to that term diet that you and I dislike, Nikki. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's like, first of all, it's like, here's your prescription to like longevity and health. And, you know, you follow this path and you're going to get to nirvana and mana is going to rain down upon you. All of these wonderful things. (laughs) Uh, it, it, there's so many problems and you're going to have better sex and like, yeah. you know, lose a ton of weight <laughs> and, and you're just going to head to Vegas and everything's going to be beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> so number one diet is like such a hollow <laughs> illusion, yes. you know? at least a disillusion. And the Mediterranean diet, there's just been so much stuff. And the thing with the New York Times is that they said, this has been a time tested way to lead to better health. And here are the tenants. There's like five ideas. And then within that, they're like, here are recipes so that you can incorporate it better. And they had huevos rancheros. <laughs> they had a tofu, celery, cashew stir fry. Mm-hmm. They had ideas, you know, that were recipes that were developed by authors from all different ethnic, you know, heritages and stuff. And so I was like, and avocados. Come on. Mm. You know what? Every single time that I'm like, and salmon. Salmon is not from the Mediterranean. And so I was like, so all of a sudden now the Mediterranean diet has swallowed up so much of the world and people are supposed to follow this diet to live better. But they're really living these very cross-cultural intersectional lives. So there's like a disconnect, right? It's like unreal. It's like, I think that we can only have like strategies for good health and and diets that, like you said, is personalized and unique mm-hmm. to each person. And we have to find ways to do that. And we need to have those prompts, not some kind of umbrella that says, y'all come in now because we're just going to suck you up. And, you yeah. know, that's just like the way it is. And now everybody's part of the Mediterranean And when I wrote that newsletter post for my newsletter, Pass the Fish Sauce, this one woman said, I want you to know my family's from Sicily. And growing up, I ate so much seafood, not for health, but because it was cheap. Mm. And my mother grew up like just, you know, they 
got the fish because it was free from the Mediterranean. It is right there. They ate things from their garden because it was also affordable because it was free. I mean, she was mm-hmm. like, this was out of necessity and that's what they ate. And then someone else pointed out on Instagram, they're like, no one talks about the high rate of obesity in Spain. Hmm. And there's all of this stuff that the, the gloss is over. And I think that the Mediterranean diet was great in the 1960s when people were still trying to like, they needed to see some new vistas. Good way of putting it. Yes. Yeah. I can but, see that. Yeah. But nowadays, I think that in 2024, we need more global vistas, especially as we are trying to figure out how to deal with ultra processed foods. Yeah. Which is really like, you know, they taste good, they're addictive, but they could be really, really bad for your health if yeah. because they're formulated so that you get addicted to them. Yeah. And, you know, wholesome cooking and identifying issues like you did, Nikki, with gluten. It's like, you know, you start kind of like figuring things out for yourself yeah. and what's going to help you live a healthy, happier life. And that's the thing is like, I think that if you strategically figure things out for yourself, you're going to then go, oh, this is fun because I'm like, yeah. this is bespoke living. <laughs> yes. You know, it's so true. My friend Melinda Moyer, she's a parenting newsletter, just had a newsletter this week about raising kids and how when kids, when you empower kids, even though it's not easy to do things on their own, how much happier they are. And it made me think as you're talking, I'm like, it's the same thing. When we figure these things out for ourselves, knowing that this is not going to be the panacea that's promised that's going to fly us to Vegas, (laughs) but this is the journey that we took and we trust ourselves. We learn to trust ourselves. Then we can take that trust with us anywhere and in any restaurant or any place we, because we know what feels good in our own bodies. Exactly. This is something you practice. I mean, you know, it's like mm-hmm. look at like yoga, meditation. It's like you practice it. You know, people yeah. go, you know, whenever you start doing yoga, it's like, oh, thank you for, you know, practicing today. And it's like, you go, ha, ha, it just sounds like mumbo jump. But it is a practice because yeah. it's not perfect, right? There are yeah. days when I'm like oh, yeah. downward dogging. I'm just like, I'm just glad to be here. Yeah. Or tr- tree pose. And I'm like, you know, I'm wobbly today. And other days I'm like, ooh, I'm standing upright like a nice tree. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, and meditation too. I mean, we talk about all this stuff, but we also don't talk about like, it's challenging yeah. to do this stuff, yeah. you know? Right. And similarly, like your eating habits, your healthy habits are also challenging, but they can also be fun. And if you try to practice and play with them more, it gets easier to work yeah. plants into your daily eating. Yeah. And then when you go out and my husband and I have started doing this, we go out and we're like, now, like looking, scanning a menu and you know, identifying where the plants are mm-hmm. and ordering more of those dishes than the meaty ones. Yeah. And then when you eat them, then you realize, you know, they really don't give you that much vegetables <laughs> in the <laughs> restaurant <laughs> compared to what you eat at home. And then you realize, I really like vegetables and I like the way I cook them, yeah. however that may be. Uh. And I'm going to go home and I'm, you know, maybe a salad gave you inspiration at the restaurant. And then you go home, you create your own version or whatever. But I mean, it's like you're taking truly life into your own hands. Mm, (laughs) You're eating life. You're eating life. Oh, Andrea, I could talk with you all day. And I'm so sad that I have to wrap things up. But I think there are so many nuggets of fun wisdom within this conversation I want to show everyone who's watching the video, your book, Evergreen Vietnamese, is such a fun, delicious way to incorporate more plants into one's diet. As you said, it's a practice and it can be a fun one and it can also be one of kind of going in and finding ourselves. I feel like the kitchen can be a really powerful place to find ourselves and to gain our own sovereignty. And I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for this conversation People can find your newsletter. Can you say the name of your, I love your newsletter and I hope everyone will go check it out. It's called Pass the Fish Sauce. I'll say it. (laughs) 
That's right. Pass the fish sauce. It's on Substack. We all have quirky, quirky names because we want to, because it is taking life into our own hands at the keyboard. Well, I have one more question for you, and it's a fun one. And I hope to have you back on so we can talk more about food and recipes. But that is, it's your last meal on earth. What would it be? Most of the time, Nikki, people ask me what I would have on a two ingredients on a desert island, you know. Uh, <laughs> I often tell people it can be just in this moment. Like it doesn't yeah. have to be like a forever question, but just like right now in this moment, what, what would it be? Right now, I would just like have a really perfect bowl of rice and some oh. pickles. Mm. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's that. just like think the about perfect that. bowl of rice, you know, it has, it, because rice is really hard to grow mm. and getting good grains is hard and cooking it well is really great. And then pickles can be savory, sweet, tangy, and they add, you know, and it's very simple. And yeah, and a piece of fried tofu would make me really happy <laughs> too. <laughs> I just, the simplest things can bring such joy. Doesn't have to be complicated, does it? Does not, does not. That's a great question. Thank Thank you you so much for coming on. My pleasure. My pleasure. This is too much fun. Thank you so much for listening. If this work resonates with you in any way, you can support it by leaving a review or comment or sharing it with friends. Also, you can sign up for the newsletter, Mind, Body, Spirit, Food, and by becoming a paid member for just $5 a month, you help fund this entire project. Thank you so much to all of you who are already subscribed, especially to those paid subscribers. This work could not happen without you. I'm Nikki Sizemore, and as always, remember to nourish yourself with intention and love.